The Marlins were not swept in Chicago, almost. They avoided the sweep on the Sunday game. And we're going to be recapping on all of the action, including first look at Peyton Burdick and Edward Cabrera back up and Jesus Lazardo back up. Plenty to get into on today's Locked On Marlins. You are Locked On Marlins, your daily podcast on the Miami Marlins, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Monday. Happy Monday, guys, and welcome to Locked On Marlins, your daily Marlins podcast with me, Peter Pratt. Follow me on Twitter, of course, at Miami Marlins underscore UK. Subscribe to the pod, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hello and greetings if you are watching. You can see it's dark here in the UK, recording late on a Monday with the UK GOAT, of course, regular rotation, UK stud, Sean Barrett in the house. Sean, how are we doing, brother? I'm doing well. Good weekend of baseball for myself, maybe not so much for the Marlins, but I'll take it where I can get it. Absolutely, Sean Barrels Barrett, I believe, is the uh, is the new nickname. There was some some footage emerging of Sean. Looked to me like you were leading off. I guess were you leading off? No, you couldn't have been. There was a guy on uh, on yeah. second base. So there was the, the actual footage is a little bit ropey as far as what you see on the uh, the graphics. But you I know, see it's it's it was good to finally get that off my mind. I, I'm I'm pretty sure that that Jose Arena was pitching against you, and uh, you know he was the, the opposing pitcher. There were a few up and in for sure. You were ducking, you were ducking out of a few, mate. And then finally, um, there was a blown. Was there a blown bunt? You went and bunt, and then decided, no, I'm not bunting. And then then he thought, I've had, I've seen enough now. I've had two headshots and a blown bunt. It's time to just lace one down the third baseline, mate. Bring in that run, drive in that run. Crowd going wild. Sean Barrett into second base, cruising. Finger in the air, driving the bus. I don't know what was going on. It looked good, mate. Did you win the game? Uh, no, we. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, boy, oh boy. Well, nevertheless, it's great to see footage emerging of our of our legend, our UK legend, Sean Barrett, of course, uh, with a stick in his hand. And listen, that, that throws to it. I mean, you see it on Twitter many, many times. Hey, I played the game, and da, 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 I used to play the game. Sean Barrett can absolutely come into the argument like that if he needs to. Hey, I've played the game, and I know. I've never played the game, so I, I don't have that leverage, unfortunately. Nevertheless, it's a Monday episode of Locked on Marlins. We are recapping on the Cubs series, which oh, in some ways went to form. Two lefties going for the Cubs, two L's for the Fish, and then a lefty for the Marlins coming in and doing the damage on Sunday uh, with a couple of bombs. And uh, there's plenty of little kind of storylines to get into, no doubt. Um, today's uh, episode is brought to you by Vroom. And with Vroom, you can buy a rental, you can buy a car, rental car? You can buy a car entirely online, have it delivered straight to you. So you never have to go to a dealership again. So next time you buy a car, just grab your phone, go to vroom.com and check out thousands of great cars. All right then, Sean. So let's let's go back pre this series. Big news dropped. It dropped live when I was recording with Isaac Azut that uh, Jesus Sanchez was optioned. We had rumors coming that Peyton Burdick got on his way up. We're thinking, okay, who's who's going to be the guy? De La Cruz, maybe. We then got the answer. Jesus Sanchez optioned. Finally, I mean, finally, in some ways, we waited all the way till the first week of August. Um, Jesus Sanchez has had a real struggle since effectively what mid-April. It's been tough for him. Just your immediate reaction on that news and the surprise levels that maybe you felt when when the news dropped. Yeah, a little bit of surprise because he, he over the last couple of weeks, you know, had warmed up a little bit. You know, he wasn't mm. smashing the ball, but he, he was significantly better than he had been over those struggles. I think the biggest surprise for me for him going down wasn't so much um, the the rec, the on field issues; it was the off field issues that we started to hear about. Um, mm. That so far had kind of been swept under the rug. So that was really interesting for me. Uh, another thing mm. interesting, but it was Burdick coming up. You know, we've talked about Hayra, we've talked about yeah. and, and all over the year. At no point did we really sort of say, look, oh, where's Burdick? When, when's he coming up? So to see him was a little bit of a surprise. Um, his numbers in the minors don't look too bad. Good on base percentage, but, you know, the average isn't quite there. Um, mm. So, you know, he's a big dude. So, you know, yeah. when he hits the ball, he's going to hit the ball. So I don't expect a big average from him. And his minor league numbers never really pretend that either. But, you know, no. he's got his opportunity now and, and 
as a Marlins fan, you're so used to saying that this time of the year, you've got all these prospects and young guys coming up, and you're like, well, you've got your shot, mate. Now, now is your chance. Mm. Let's yep. see what you can do with it. And when we've spoken about LeBlanc as well, uh, and last week, and about how he's got his opportunity, and I'm sure we'll get into what he's done with it so far. No doubt about it. Um, let's let's just kind of complete that cycle on Jesus Sanchez. Like you said, um, coming off the back of the, uh, the 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 option, there's two bits that are interesting. Let's go back to, to swings and misses. Um, you know, Craig uh, sharing some information on that that you dug into. It was actually Ram Sports that was kind of breaking the news. If you, I saw this tweet myself actually at the time. I think we all did in our little. Um, uh, WhatsApp group and you know Alan Witts, the biggest Jesus Sanchez fan out there for sure. Um, you know he was like, "Boys, do you, you believe this is true?" You know, effectively the report was Jesus Sanchez didn't show, and they couldn't. He wasn't answering texts or phone calls, so effectively the Marlins called the police and got him to go and check at the, the hotel, effectively looking for him. So um, I think it was originally worded like they feared he was dead, which I think was slightly uh, overplayed. I don't think that was the case. They just couldn't get hold of him, and the reason they couldn't get hold of him was. I either slept in or forgot there was a day game. I don't know. But nevertheless, he showed up two minutes before the start. Obviously, wasn't in the starting lineup then, but actually had to come in and pinch hit. I think some injuries kicked in that day. So Jesus Sanchez would have been heavily on the naughty step. If you can imagine, you showed up to work seven hours late. Um, and then next thing is you are forced into a situation where he had to be put into the game. So kind of funny the way that played out. So there's clearly... There's been some stuff brewing there anyway with Jesus Sanchez. The other bit too, Joe Frasaro talked about on his own podcast um, today, that it was, the timing's interesting. The fact that they're, they're sending him down now. He only has one minor league option year remaining. And we've obviously been on the roster all year this year. Only now when the Marlins are out of it effectively, is is he now optioned? If he's, if he's down in, in the minor leagues for 20 days or more, then that will be his final minor league option year burned. So the Marlins will head into next year um, not knowing whether Jesus Sanchez is a part of the plans and not really having the option, literally, to do anything about it. And also, if they try to move on from him via trade, um, clearly that handcuffs the, the the trade partners as well because they effectively are kind of rule five situation, really, where he has to be on the roster. Um, so what's what's your thoughts on that because that i think is a really good point that joe Versailles has brought up there and like when you sit back and think about it it doesn't make a lot of sense to now option him you you could protect and protect that option year with a view of giving you more flexibility next year on your own roster or trading him to someone else that may think hey great we can get him we can work with him but we're not forced to carry him on the 26 man all year there's still that opportunity to kind of send him down to triple a if we need so What's your thoughts on that approach on the fish? I mean, it's interesting because it is that twenty-day sort of period. Like, if they're, if they're going to do it in the sense that they're going to bring them up before that point, then it seemed little reason to actually go through that process. Just to, you know, put him down and, and 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 have him play for a couple of weeks in the minors, see if he can and build himself back up to bring up. In a way, and the way I see it is, is that kind of sort of says that the Marlins are really out on him. That mm. they just to get him off the the forty man, and and they're going to move on from him. And as you put it, you know that there is value in that option year. So if they are yes. intending to trade him in the off season, then it does seem silly for them to have done it. I mean, he's been on the roster nearly all year. You know, to wait this long to finally use an option when really didn't need to is it, is kind of questionable. But if it is the case that they're done with him. Like some of the stories about that we're hearing about how he's not making any changes, he's not reacting. You know, he's got these holes in his swing, and we've spoken for weeks and weeks about having you know that that high pitch that he just can't hit at the moment. Yeah. If he's yeah, yeah. not any you know purposeful changes or trying to make adjustments, then in a way you're almost saying he's he's reached his ceiling, and that is that of not a major league player, which is wild wild in many ways to be saying now at this stage considering what we saw and how things had progressed and to the point the Marlins were happy with him effectively manning center field um, all year you're right that's a really good point though that like the swing is so long and you know aggressive but you know it, it's exposing this hole at the top of the zone as soon as as soon as clubs found that it was game over for Jesus and so it's like 
hey, we've now found that. We're going to need to find a way to counter counterbalance that. We're going to need to shorten it up, even whatever it is. It just nothing's changed. It's looked the same all the way through, flailing away with this looping long swing, and the same results really in the main. Like you said, he, he's kind of got a little bit better recently. Now optioned. I find the timing puzzling. I find the decision puzzling in line with that kind of, um, you know, that, that minor league option year, if they're going to burn that one and kind of take away that value piece there. I find, like I said, the timing puzzling. Clearly, he was having a real struggle. He's then turned up to a game two minutes to go, basically on the naughty step. That's the time to option him. You know, like send him down at that point. Like punish him. Like send him down. He's He's performing like shit anyway. Send him down. And they don't. They carry him for another month and then finally send him down. I mean, Peyton Burdick needed to be added to the uh, the 40-man anyway. I think he was Rule 5 eligible. So I'm not against the, the Burdick move. Um, I want to get your take on Burdick specifically and what we've seen in the first, you know, a couple of games of ABs uh, that we've seen. It includes a bomb. So, you know, it's relatively encouraging. But uh, before we do that, it's our first ad of the day, guys. And it's our good, good friends over at LinkedIn and LinkedIn Jobs. As you, as you gear up for fall, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free, baby. So you can create job posts in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to so reach your network and beyond. And it's the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. So you can add your job and the purple hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile. Spread the word you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. they got simple tools. Uh, like screening questions to make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. So what you need to do, you got to post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. Post your job for free. Link uh, LinkedIn. Terms and conditions apply. Can't read. Can't read. Nevertheless, um, Sean, first impressions of Peyton Burdick. There was a bomb mixed in there. Um, you know, uh, you've already alluded to his, his minor league uh, profile. I guess we kind of have seen that in the major leagues too, right? Absolutely. I think the one of the interesting things, I don't think we ever spoke about, or at least I haven't on Locked On, but we did for, for a long period of time on Fish Across the Pond, was the idea that the Marlins were hurt massively, maybe more so than any other team by that lost minor league year because the pre that the, the the roster across the whole of the minor leagues was massive you know there were so many stars and so much talent there and then for them to all have a year off and I think Burdick probably looking at the numbers was affected that way like pre mm. that year he was absolutely smashing the ball you know in, in again admittedly low A and A ball but then he lost a year and he was old not old but old for the level to begin with he was yep. drafted a bit later. He wasn't a high school guy. So after that last year, he was sort of pumped into double A and, and triple A. And what happened was those Ks started to grow. Um, so, you know, it's been nice this year. He's actually settled down a little bit in triple A. Those Ks have come down. Average is still really, really low. Um, but he's just an interesting guy because I think he's got the tools. It's just a case of he needs playing time and needs reps and and I'm looking forward to seeing him play. I think it is a case of you just got to let him experience, you know, proper major league pitching and yeah. see what he can do with it. Because at this point, he's 25 years old. I mean, it's it's yeah. now or never for him, which is unfortunate. So while the numbers at the minor league level don't really sort of show what he can be, I think we have to see what he can do because, yeah. as you said, he's Rule 5 eligible. So maybe this is his one opportunity. This is one audition to see whether or not he can play at the major league levels, which is unfortunate, but it is the nature of what happened when we lose that year. Yeah, no no doubt. I think that's a really uh, interesting point to make, and certainly some of this being commented on, the fact that you know that year off um, certainly hurt the Marlins and many other teams out there, but the Marlins, I think, were you know heavily impacted by that, um, for sure. I... I haven't seen a lot of Peyton Burdick before this, but you know, to your point, like he's he's got the call up. It's it's an opportunity for the guy, and you know, we're going to see what we're going to see. the The best thing, and this may not be the best thing for us as fans in general. You know, we're still, you know, we do watch the games and we want the Marlins to win, right? You know, we want to see some some offense, and we want to have fun, and want to get some Ws. Makes sense. 
problem is the schedule is absolutely rough, really rough. So that's going to mean it's going to be some rough outings out there. However, what it does mean, in my opinion, is that the August and September numbers are going to be real. That's what I'm going to like. Last year with Jesus Sanchez, for example, I remember watching the games and thinking, it's all well and good, but there's a lot of bombs against the, the teardown Nats here. And there's a lot of bombs against, you know, teardown Cubs, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's the problem. That's why you can be a little bit, you know, you can get a bit carried away with some of the numbers. So I, I if Burdick sticks up here and he's playing most days now and blood A uh, against, you know, we're about to run into the Phils, the Braves, the Padres, the Dodgers, all back to back to back. You know, if they perform against these teams, these clubs, you know, they're, they're the kind of numbers that you can, you know, be confident in moving forwards and kind of work out what have we got. Is Bladé a big leaguer? Is Burdick? Is LeBlanc or LeBlanc? Uncertain about the pronunciation. Is it a silent C? Uncertain. I believe it is. Paul Severino has been calling him LeBlanc all, all series. It caught me off guard. I was like, who's LeBlanc? Anyway, so the numbers are real. JJ Bladé, though, Sean, let's kind of transition into him. Um, what's been your, he's been up a little bit longer than Burdick now. What's been your assessment of JJ thus far? I mean, it's been tough to say. I mean, obviously, he's he's been man in centre field for the majority of the time, which is kind of what you know we wanted to see in a sense. And I remember talking about when he started seeing centre field reps in the minor leagues with you, the idea that you know that would be a really good avenue for him to turn up to the major leagues. You know, if he can play a, a decent centre field, you're not expecting you know massive, massive offensive value there. If you can be defensive mm-hmm. and good. And that's kind of what we were talking about with Jesus. Like, if he can just fake it till he makes it there. I mean, the numbers, they're not great, are they? You know, the K rate's above 30. It's a low walk rate. Um, mm. But it is it is that sense of, you know, it is what it is. And as you said, with the, the, the opposition that they're seeing now, the way that the, the schedule's set up, you want teams playing their division a lot later in the year, or at least Major League to do. Because then you've got that that openness latency. Yeah. yeah. And the Marlins, unfortunately, are in a tough. You know, the Phillies, the Mets, the Braves—they're all fighting for the playoffs. They're all, you know, the trade deadline. They were making moves. You know, these are big teams that we're playing against. So yeah. you know, it's it's a trial by fire for sure. Um, and at the moment, you know, he's he's underperforming. But you know, it is a case of you've got to give them opportunities. We're talking fifteen games. We're talking fifteen plate appearances you know it's, it's too early to tell but two months that that might be all they get um, it might be which is unfortunate but that's where the Marlins are um, they're going to be going into an off season where the fans and and a- everyone associated with the team you know even the beat reporters are talking about this off season being huge Marlins need to make some moves need to start you know really showing some impetus to actually wanting to be winning baseball teams uh, and some of these hitting prospects just might end up not panning out. And, you know, we've seen that already happen, you know, with many players that we gave too many opportunities to. Yeah. So this is a situation where the Marlins, you know, cut bait early um, and say, we can't we can't give you two, three years. We, we no. can't kill in these years, especially when we're talking about Sandy and the contract that he's on. They need to win during that window. They do. I think it's a great assessment, mate. And, you know, the reality is Bladé and Burdick now, they're both on the 40-man. They, you know, they've got multiple years now where they could be optioned down. And clearly this is being driven, like them being up is driven by the fact that Avi and Soler uh, are both hurt right now. And so that creates the opportunity. Plus BA is hurt as well, who's been kind of manning a, a corner outfield spot. Plus Birdie, who's you know been playing everywhere. But like, you know, to your point, this may be the only real audition they get. I mean, let's you know what are the what are the Marlins going to do in the off season? Let's assume they go and add another another outfielder, you know, a center fielder, perhaps a legit one. Um, all of a sudden, these guys are blocked then, and so yeah, I mean, the Marlins clearly wanted to do well. I mean, could could Burdick come, you know, go on fire, catch fire? Maybe next thing is, you know, maybe he proves he can swing it. The Marlins think, okay, cool. Let's see if we can go out and, and you know move like a burdick plus an arm to go and get someone. I don't know. We'll wait and see. But like in terms of my eyeball assessment, I've sat on the couch all weekend. UK friendlies back to back to back, which is great to see. Um, I sat there and watched all the games. My assessment on it was 
I really like JJ Bladé's approach. I really do. And it's been a tough weekend for him because there's two lefties on the mound um, against him. So it's it's not been easy. Um, but I just, there's something there. And I'm I'm encouraged by what I've seen by Bladé. Burdick, it's a little bit too early to tell. Obviously, he hit a huge bomb, 420 feet, I believe. So that was great to see. Great to see him get off the mark. So I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued with Burdick to see what we've got. Um, I, I just, I definitely feel that there's something there with Bloody. I do. And uh, I'm, I'm really intrigued to see the way these next couple of months go, for sure. There's some guys coming back, though, soon. You know, uh, Brian Anderson's on his way back, maybe after this Philly series. Uh, John Birdie, too. So, you know, again, where do they go with the roster at that point? But you'd hope that they kind of keep those two up and let them, let them play it out, I think. So, for me, early indications uh, have been good. I'm going to get your take on the first base situation after the ad, um, because for me, it remains a head scratcher. It may feed into what they do with Brian Anderson and John Birdie, but let's get into first base. And also, the pitching staff, the rotation has been reduced, not reduced in terms of people have been taken away. It has been juiced. There is some new studs back in town and they are performing, and it's going to be great to see all the way out. Um, but final ad, and it's our good friends over at Bet Online at betonline.net. It's your fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. You can find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. They've got every sport covered. Major League Baseball, of course. NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf, tennis, Formula One, everything. Everything is there, bet online. They continue to be a number one online resource for all your sports wagering information. They've got live in-game betting scores and podcasts. So much over there. Head to bet online today. Use your mobile device to learn about the action happening today, tomorrow, this week. Bet online is where the game starts. Sean, first base. Discuss. <laughs> it's it's a long-standing conversation, isn't it? It what is. What are they going to do? I mean, the trade deadline's gone, so that's yeah. one, that's one discussion point gone. Yep. Cooper still on the Marlins. Thank God for me, anyway. Um, I think Lewin at this point, you know, what are we talking about? Lewin needs to see at bats. Lewin needs to see games, and you know, defensively, he's a great first baseman. Aggie, not so much, and Cooper, you know, even question more questionable. Certainly, the risk for health as well. Mm. So, I think that realistically, when we get these guys back, when BA is back, there's going to be that real logjam of like, can we afford? And you know, I don't see Lewin going down. I think. I think Aggie does get DFA'd ultimately. I think that is the only option for them. You know, there, there is no beneficial reason to to send Leitwin down. Everything that we talk about from this point onwards is about what are the Marlins doing to prepare for next year. Yep. And Aggie's not part of that plan. So uh, as much as it's a shame, and we all love him, and he's been great, and uh, let's not forget how the Marlins acquired him. Mm. He was, he was basically released by the, the Rays because they didn't want to pay that ARB number. And that's what's going to happen to him this year. They're not going to want to pay what he's due next year. And I don't think no. well, Evidently, no one else was because they couldn't trade him for a bucket of balls. So he's going to get DFA. That's the only option that I can see that even makes any sense for them going forward, which is a shame, but this is where we are. You know, the, the Marlins need to see what they've got for next year. And that ultimately is going to be my answer to nearly every question about what the Marlins should do going forwards. No doubt. It's been an interesting situation. I think it's been driven by injuries more generally to the roster where they've kind of like, you know, they obviously were trying to move Aggie. They couldn't get a deal done, which to me is surprising in many ways. You know, there's some questions knocking around about, you know, Aguilar this year. Is it the same Aggie? Has the flame kind of slightly gone out, you know, with him? He's a big personality, big, big personality. And I think he was a big, big part of that. Well, no, I don't think he was. I know he was a big part of the 2020 run and he had a great 2021 as well. So, but I do wonder, like I've said all year wrong, all year long, this, this clubhouse vibe has just been off all year. It has. And I wonder if part of that is linked to Aggie and, you know, he's, he's El Capitan, Mark too, right? Like, you know, it's maybe Miggy Rose Clubhouse has been historically. Aguilar's a big, big voice and a big, big personality in there. And, you know, there's a lot of guys being fed into that that clubhouse. And, you know, maybe if there's some friction there, 
I don't know. I don't know that. There's no fact behind that. I'm just calling it out to say that he is a very exuberant character. Like, he really is. And I just do wonder how... Some people may take to that on you know on a long-term basis. And it's kind of been playing in my mind a little bit there around about Aggie, just how lively he is. You know, it's all good. I think when you're winning, it's the type of guy you like to have around. I think when you're losing, you know, that's, I think, a different situation with that type of personality and, and mentality. So I don't know. But to your point, though, with, with Aggie, they couldn't move him. We've now been in a position, I mean, we, we heard from Kim Ang via Craig Mish. We, we want, you know, Lewin Diaz to take pretty much all the ABs at first base. And then what happened for the next four games? He had two ABs. So there's still a problem here. So what's happening this week? Aguilar's DFA. He has to be, unless there's another slew of injuries that happen, you know, either to Coop or anyone, basically, as, as they, you know, not to Coop, but. Of course, it won't be Coop. But as they fa- as they phase these guys back in, it's time for Aggie to, to be DFA'd. Like other teams have done with their vets, they couldn't move either. Like the Phillies did with DD. Like uh, uh, there's a few other names anyway knocking around the league that were all DFA'd at a similar kind of time, a couple of days after the deadline. Yeah, we couldn't move and we tried to, and it's time for them to go. And uh, you know, Aggie's going to be in that same spot. The, the the bigger question though now, Sean, at first base is well, what happens if what happens if Lewin doesn't pay out, pan out now? Like, you know, he's not hitting great, and the, the the limited opportunities being given. But when we kind of piece together all his abs, like it hasn't been good. The de- you know, okay, the defense is good, blah blah blah. But if this doesn't pan out with Lewin and Aggie's gone, like. And I don't think there's any options left on Lewin either. So they basically need to make a decision on him this year, which is why he needs the abs. Where are the Marlins going to go at first base moving forwards? I mean, I think at that point you're looking at about a low-level free agent in the off-season. I think, I think they need to give Lewin an opportunity, and you can say he's been given X amount of at bats over his his career, but yeah. he's never been given a stint. He's never been given a long stint. Like if they were to give him a solid rest of the season, that would be his longest period, sustained period. Oh, at the major league level, and they need to do that. They need to give them that opportunity. Uh, yeah, ultimately, if it doesn't pan out, you know, would they use Aggie anyway? If they kept Aggie all year long and Lewin didn't work out, would they pay Aggie that number next year? I don't think so. There's no way they're paying ten million to Aguilar next year. Not a chance. No way. So give Lewin that opportunity. Worst comes to worst, you're putting Coop at first base next year. That bat plays. We know that. You're risking the injury a little bit, but ultimately, you know, I think there's options there. I, I don't think DFA and Aggie affects your ability to compete any more next year than it would by keeping him. Um, so yeah, it is what's going to happen, and Laywin's going to get an opportunity. You know, as you said, they said they want to give him as many play appearances as they can, and then didn't. So I think they're just waiting maybe for some of these bats to come back have that depth because if you did DFA Aggie and then all of a sudden there was a slew of injuries like you said you've you've pinned yourself into a situation where you're now bringing up random guys you know, let's get some guys back let's get that depth so that there's that availability and then mm. they can DFA Aggie I think that's probably what they're waiting for I, I'm still just shocked as well I mean we had Herard and Canacion working at first base a few years back it's like okay you know, maybe outfield won't work or maybe we've got too many outfielders as, as an organization, which, you know, there is some, maybe some merit to that. There's a lot of outfielders brew in here, but, you know, whether any of them are superstars or major league players is another question. But, you know, Heira, is he a DH? Well, we've got too many of them as well already. Is he an outfielder? I mean, to me, he looked like an outfielder in, in the, the real short stint he had. I mean, he had that outfield assist, absolutely gunned him down from, from right field. Um, but the other question then is, can he play first base as well? Like, you know, at this point of the year, get him up and let's find out, you know, get some you know, DFA Aggie. Coop, Lewin, and Hey Ra, they can cycle around DH and first base and off days and platoons and all that kind of thing. Let's see what we got. I mean, what are we doing here? Billy Hamilton's on the roster. We don't need Billy Hamilton on the roster. We don't. Clear the space. Hey Ra up. Let's see what we've got. To your point. We don't need to know what Billy Hamilton's got for next year. He's not part of the he's not part of the organization. He's not part of the plans. Encarnacion is on the 40 man, was on the 40 man, he's been on it for three years. And we've only seen what 
two games, including a salami. I mean, come on. It's wild. Some of the decision-making, the roster construction, it continues to be a head. It was a head-scratcher last year. We were like, oh, my days, what's going on? Finally, they get, like, Charles LeBlanc up. LeBlanc's absolutely on fire. I can't, I can't say LeBlanc. LeBlanc! Come on. Anyway. But LeBlanc's up. He's taking his opportunity, though, with both hands, it seems. Like, you know, okay. A bit like Jesus Sanchez. We've got to be careful with this. But nevertheless, like, it is... It's encouraging to see in some ways and equally disappointing on the flip side, right? Where you've like, we've had, we had months of Astadio up and we had, you know, Eric Gonzalez up and LeBlanc's been doing this in AAA all year. And then finally he comes up and it's like, oh, actually uh, the, the dude looks like he can hit. And what have we done? Why didn't we get him up there? But nice to see though, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's an incredibly sh- small sample size. Um, and, and we can be fooled like we were maybe potentially last year with Jesus and how he performed. Um, but no, the, the numbers are they're, they're quite nice. So I had a quick look at it and in his eight games. Uh, there's been no Marlin to start their career uh, with more hits. As you know, there was one, it was Ozuna, and he's in the top three for slugging of Marlins for their first eight games of their career. Wow. Uh, and funnily enough, it's Nick Fortes leading that list from last year. So um, there you, you go. Can- to be fooled into these numbers, but no, for those first eight games, for what it's worth, he's been great. Um, and again, that conversation of they've got an opportunity, you know, I want to see LeBlanc getting as many at bats as he can, you know, to see whether or not this is real. Now, he could we could be talking next week about him going hitless for the week and yeah. we'll forget about this conversation, but for now, he's hitting, he's playing well, looks good, and, and we'll see how it continues. Is the beautiful thing of uh, YouTube and podcast form, mate, that no one can ever forget this conversation happened. Like it just it is always there in the ether. So they'll always look back and say, hey, remember those those two British dudes saying that Charles LeBlanc was a, a potential major leaguer in 2023? <laughs> Fools. <laughs> Nevertheless, you, you make a really good point. It's great to see. Like, like you said, Nicky Fortes came up last year. You know, he, uh, as you mentioned, he was a historic run uh, in many ways uh, to the start of his Marlins career. And actually, it carried over. Like, Nick Fortes, to me, still looks still looks fine. Still looks a, a major leaguer, no doubt. So, you know, which is great to see. Uh, it's, it, you know, it it's fun. These are fun little storylines, I guess. Um, you know, just to kind of see how things go. One other thing that caught my eye today, and I think this is probably the last topic because we're already over 30 minutes, but it was never going to be a 30-minute episode. We haven't even spoken about it with Cabrera and uh, Jesus Lozado, but someone else that caught my eye, um, someone put up a... It was effectively an Excel spreadsheet showing wins and losses when each player was in the lineup and not in the lineup. And, uh, you know, there's you know, there's limited amounts you could probably take on a player-by-player basis into that. But what really stood out to me, I would say, is the win-loss record when uh, John Birdie and Luke Williams... And it's not like they're not combined, but when you look at both of their numbers, when Birdie is in the lineup, what do the Marlins do? They win more often than they lose. And the same for Luke Williams. And it kind of got me thinking back. It was like, you know, where Donnie was just, you know, kicking off in that that presser, basically saying we've, we've got all the same dudes. We've got all these strikeout guys that just get mowed down, no speed. They're slow as hell. You know, this roster's constructed in that way. It's clear to see, like, Donnie Baseball wants to play the speed game. And when the speed is there, the Marlins play well. Birdie in the lineup, Luke Williams, like, they bring different things to the fish. And I think I think that's really interesting. And, you know, it, it is something that the, they kind of need to address because they, I think they went a little bit too heavy into this kind of, like, power lineup. But the bargain basement power lineup. And when you kind of strip it away... Birdie on the bases, Hamilton on the bases, Luke Williams on the bases. Like it creates pressure and it creates runs and it creates momentum too. So I just that that kind of stuck out to me. Equally, Miggy Rowe, the biggest amount of L's. <laughs> he's got the most losses of any player. And the, the Marlins perform really well when uh, when he's not in the lineup, which I thought was quite funny, to be honest with you. Um, but any takeaways from that, Sean? I think you see you saw the tweet I'm I'm, I'm alluding to. I did, yeah. I mean I'm, you know, the guy's putting a lot of effort, so I don't want to, I don't want to kill it too much. But I mean, you've got that stat in basketball, haven't you? That that plus minus when they're on the field, on on the court side. So mm-hmm. that that stat kind of does have some value, but I don't see, I don't see the worth there as far as it. There's so many intangibles, there's so many differences. 
you know, you, your, who star in and the competition. I think there's too many variables for that to, to get any real value from. I mean, it is that sense of like when Miggy's, you know, Miggy's had a bad year, let's not, you know, fool ourselves. So when he's not in the lineup, you've got a, you've not got a guy here in, you know, a buck 80. So of course they're, yep. they're going to have better opportunities. You know, it is at this point, you know, the Marlins offensively have been so underpowered that I don't think you can sort of use that win loss for each player to determine any sort of value. I think we can just accept that the offense that the Marlins have rolled out this year has has not worked. It's underperformed, not just those big value guys that we brought in, but, you know, Miggy, you know, for years has been that constant sort of good defense high average guy, you know, that, that you can put in, you know, at the number two slot or, you know, as your false starter and uh, starter in the nine hole. So I, I, you know, it was interesting and there's, 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 I'm sure you can take some takeaways from it, but ultimately the Marlins just haven't been there, have they? They haven't. And I mean, let's, you know, Miggy Rowe this year, let's not forget, I say forget, that's not the right way of phrasing it. But Mickey Rowe, he's a, he's a, he's a two-war player this year thus far. Um, granted, it's all defensive. Uh, you know, it, it's defensive metrics because his, his hitting stats, are, you know, he, his career, you know, OPS plus is 86. He's on, at the moment, he's like a 77 OPS dude. So he's, you know, he's effectively 25% below average offensively um, right now. You know, he's hitting 235, six bombs, like, this is where war, like, you got to look at maybe the, you know, we, we're kind of focusing on the offensive war, really, is where we need to look at. And Miggy's below average there. That's the point I was making a few, you know, maybe a few episodes back to say that you you look at the teams that are really successful at the moment, like, they're getting so much offensive production from that position. They really are. Like, shortstop now is not just a glove and that's it. You know, the, the Marlins effectively have got Billy Hamilton at shortstop as well. Like they've got Billy Hamilton playing center yesterday and Billy Hamilton playing short in the main with Miggy. He's 33 now, Miggy. Like we shouldn't forget it. Like he's he was always a utility journeyman, really a glove first guy. And okay, he kind of raised up with the fish because he's been around for so long, but he's 33. You know, he's being asked to play a lot. He's got, he's owed four and a half million next year. It's relatively low. Like he's a two war guy, four and a half mil, but like the Marlins have got a decision to make there with Miggy, you know, heading into the year. Like, I don't think Donnie's going to be around. I don't think James Rousen's going to be around. I think they're going to clear house there. And it wouldn't shock me if they actually decide, hey, Aggie gone out of the clubhouse, Miggy gone out of the clubhouse. Let's start a fresh year and see if we can change the course here. I, it wouldn't shock me at all. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that Donnie and Rousen won't be here. And I also... I think there's a possibility, and I'm convinced that Aggie won't be. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm on the fence about where they go with Miggy because he does hold that value. He is versatile, and the defensive piece is great to have. But they need to find a, uh, you know, some some power from that shortstop position. Maybe that's Jazz, and I think that's going to be another wrinkle to this one. Is can they go and get a second baseman? Um, you know, what are they going to do with Wendell? What we're going to do with BA? There's so many storylines that you know we're going to get into here. But yeah, I mean, <sighs> Miggy Rowe, El Capitan. We'll wait and see what happens on that one. Um, you know, but like I said, we shouldn't forget he's he's way underperforming with the stick. Still a two war dude, but he's thirty three now, owed four and a half million next year. I think there's some changes required here for the fish more generally um, in terms of how they set their clubhouse up. So, yeah, Sean, we've been around the houses there, mate. I think on that one, we've got Jesus Sanchez optioned, Burdick up, first bomb for Burdick, Blade performing okay, first base still a bit of a head scratcher in summary. Um, we don't quite know, but most likely we feel like Jesus Aguilar is probably about to be DFA'd. And, um, you know, LeBlanc is up. We'll ride We'll ride the wave on LeBlanc for as long as we can. We'll work out if that is the way to pronounce his name as well. In the meantime, uh, Edward Cabrera is up and looking sensational. Lozado up. Career day for Lozado as well. So great to see from the pitch. And we haven't got time to get into that today. But um, that is us done. Monday episode, Locked on Marlins. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's a 40-minute extravaganza. So apologies for the long run time. Uh, well, maybe not apologies, but I hope you've enjoyed joining us. Uh, Sean Barrett, thank you again for joining me on Monday. It's the regular rotation uh, on a Monday. Great to have you on. Uh, and congrats on the, the extra base hit as well, like I, like I mentioned at the start of the episode. Uh, guys, that's going to wrap us up for today. We are back tomorrow with Alex Carr, 
helping to preview the Phillies series, three-game series against the Phils, the scorching hot Phils. What could possibly go wrong? And then on Wednesday, just to tease out, takes were made is in the house, so should be another extravaganza. In the meantime, guys, enjoy the off day. I'll be back tomorrow.